Have you ever wondered how the 70s family succeeded to put dinner on the table for their beloved ones with just one pound of beef? Or which bicycle was far away safer than traditional bicycles? How to make your kids to enjoy learning the multiplication table? Hey there, fellow 70s kids. Are you ready to take a trip down memory lane? Today, we're going to revisit some of the most iconic products that defined our childhoods in the groovy decade of the 1970s. So sit back, relax, and let's rewind to the days of bell bottoms and disco. Mood rings. The mood ring was one of the biggest fashion fads of the 70s, marketed as an accessory for the me decade, a time when people began to actively explore their feelings. The color-changing jewelry first became popular in New York City and quickly spread throughout the United States. Each mood ring contained a temperature-sensitive liquid crystal encased in quartz. As the body temperature of the wearer changed, the crystals changed colors. Each color the ring displayed supposedly corresponded to a different mood. There were seven colors in all, each with a different meaning. Blue meant happy, reddish-brown meant insecure, black meant the wearer was upset, golden yellow was a sign of tension, and so on. From a scientific perspective, the mood ring did have some validity as an indicator of someone's emotional state. The metal band of a mood ring conducted heat from the finger to the liquid crystal, which changed color in response to the temperature of the skin. Like all fads, the mood ring had a very limited lifespan. In this case, the lifespan of the product was quite literally fixed, in that the heat-sensitive crystals would only emit their color changes for a period of two years before they would settle permanently into a shade of black. By 1977, just two years after their introduction, the rings had faded in popularity. Hamburger Helper According to General Mills, America's weakened beef economy in the 70s led to the launch of Hamburger Helper as a promise to stretch people's dollar further. With the rise in beef prices, even more American families were introduced to their new best friend, Hamburger Helper, which helped them to use just one pound of beef, paired with the box mix, to put dinner on the table for their family. Hamburger Helper was the solution to a problem in the 70s, and for most families, they found it to be a delicious solution. When Hamburger Helper was introduced, with five flavor options consisting of beef noodle, potato stroganoff, hash, rice oriental, and chili tomato, it was kind of a no-brainer for people to utilize the pantry staple at the time. Hamburger Helper was the first of its kind and cut meal preparation time down significantly. It's also versatile because you can substitute cut-up hot dogs for beef, swap out other ingredients, and add different toppings like sour cream. As with most new products, fame and fortune don't last for long without some ingenuity. After decades on the market, it's not surprising that Hamburger Helper began to see a decline in sales, especially with all of the boxed food competition that's emerged since its inception. But General Mills wasn't letting go that easy. The company took an entire year to plan the pantry staples makeover, relaunching the brand in 2013 after 42 years. The Brady Bunch. No 70s nostalgia list would be complete without mentioning the Brady Bunch. This beloved sitcom captured the essence of family life in the 70s, complete with groovy fashion, catchy theme songs, and plenty of wholesome life lessons. It was one of the last domestic situation comedies which populated television early 70s. In 1966, Sherwood Schwartz, the sitcom producer, read a newspaper item stating that 30% of American families were step families where one or both parents were bringing into a second marriage children from a first marriage ended by death or divorce. He realized no comedy had yet focused on a merging of two families. He spent the next three years developing a series based on this premise. The Brady Bunch debuted in the fall of 1969, with most of the plots dealing with a widower architect with three sons and a single mother with three blonde daughters. The blended family moved into a giant house designed by the architect in the Los Angeles suburbs. The show was canceled in 1974, but it was something of a touchstone to people born during the 60s and 70s, many of whom grew up in single-family households or who, like the children in the series, became part of a step family. Atari 2600 The Atari 2600 is a home video game console developed and produced by Atari, 
Inc. released in September 1977 as Atari VCS with two joystick controllers, a conjoined pair of paddle controllers, and a game cartridge, initially Combat and later Pac-Man. Atari was successful at creating arcade video games, but their development cost and limited lifespan drove CEO Nolan Bushnell to seek a programmable home system. The first inexpensive microprocessors from MOS Technology in late 1975 made this feasible. Lacking funding to complete the project, Bushnell sold Atari to Warner Communications in 1976. By 1982, the Atari 2600 was the dominant game system in North America. However, it saw competition from other consoles and poor decisions by Atari management damaged both the system and company's reputation and reduced Atari's relevance in the console market, contributing to the video game crash of 1983. Warner sold Atari's home division to former Commodore CEO Jack Tramiel in 1984. In 1986, the new Atari Corporation under Tremiel released a lower-cost version of the 2600 and the backward-compatible Atari 7800. But it was Nintendo that led the recovery of the industry with its 1985 launch of the Nintendo Entertainment System. Production of the Atari 2600 ended on January 1, 1992, with an estimated 30 million units sold across its lifetime. Big Wheel the Big Wheel was first developed by Lewis Marks and Company in 1969. It was a very popular toy in the 70s in the United States, due to its low cost and because consumer groups said it was a safer alternative to the traditional tricycle or bicycle. The design was quickly imitated, under a variety of brand names. Although Big Wheel was a registered trademark, it was frequently used as a generic name for any toy whose design resembled that of Marks. In 1972, Carolina Enterprises introduced a big wheel style tricycle called the Hot Cycle. By the late 70s, Mark sold the big wheel brand name and molds to Carolina Enterprises to become known as Empire Industries, makers of the Power Cycle brand, which was Mark's biggest competitor. Big Wheel by then had grown to become a household name. An additional boost to the success of the Big Wheel was a report released on toy safety spawned by the Consumer Products Safety Commission. The report stated that of many bicycles and tricycle-related injuries, the low-slung Big Wheel was far and away safer than traditional bicycles. Big Wheel continued to be a leader in the cycle category until Empire Industries was forced to close its doors in 2001. The brand was reintroduced under new ownership in 2003 by Alpha International, Inky of Cedar Rapids, Iowa under the Empire Toys brand, and is more colorful and safer than ever. The engineers have been able to redevelop the look of the original 1969 Big Wheel with the safety and appeal of our modern generation. Polyester Leisure Suits The 70s was a decade of transition, and the young adults were trying to find themselves separate from the previous 20 tumultuous years. In the early 70s, one fad emerged as King, the leisure suit. Originally intended as a more lightweight, casual answer to the Norfolk and Safari jackets worn by most upwardly mobile men, the leisure suit, also known as the Hollywood suit, was popular in Southern California and the surrounding region. However, the leisure suit did not achieve widespread fame until polyester became a common clothing fabric. Casual, but still tailored enough to appear respectful, the leisure suit took the guesswork out of what to wear. With slacks and a matching button-down top with a wide collar or cuffs, the leisure suit was just sophisticated enough to go from work to play and just casual enough to make the wearer seem like they did not work too hard to look good. When the suits began to be manufactured in polyester, they became instant sensations. The polyester fabrication meant that they could be easily washed and were virtually wrinkle-free. Unfortunately, rather than becoming a true statement of easy style and a devil-may-care attitude, the leisure suit came to symbolize a certain level of laziness in regards to one's own appearance and habits. By the early 80s, the suits had fallen largely out of fashion, and some clubs and restaurants were actually banning customers who wore them from entering their establishments. Shrinky Dinks Introduced in 1973, 
Shrinky Dinks had kids and crafty adults creating artwork on flexible sheets of plastic that when popped in the oven would magically shrink down to approximately a third of their original size. The sheets of plastic came with either outlined drawings that you could color in yourself or blank pages, upon which practically any tracing, drawing, or rubber stamp picture could be imposed. After the artwork was colored in, you cut them out, laid them out on a baking sheet, and then slid them into an oven for a few minutes. The plastic sheets shrunk to nearly a third of their original size and became many times thicker. When plucked the cutouts from the oven, they had become hardened little masterpieces. Their colors were brighter and more intense, and if accidentally colored outside the lines when your creation was in its plastic sheet stage, your mistakes were miraculously baked away. There were TV and movie tie-in shrinky dinks, as well as arcade and toy store salutes. You were able to make jewelry, game pieces, gift or pet tags, magnets, ornaments, zipper pulls, bike plates, traced photos and keychains. You were then supposed to play with whatever it was you made, but frankly, the entertainment value was all in coloring pictures of your favorite cartoon characters, and then watching them crinkle up in the oven, and then mysteriously lie down flat again. Aspen Soda Introduced in 1978, Aspen was a clear, apple-flavored soda, its name evoking crisp mountain freshness and aiming to capture the essence of apple orchards in a carbonated form. It was meant to compete with all the lemon-lime sodas on the market, which there were many of. For some reason, though, there wasn't an apple-flavored soda, and PepsiCo stuck a bunch of money trying to fill this void. This refreshing beverage was available from 1978 to early 80s, introducing a unique apple taste to soda lovers during that era. PepsiCo sought to capitalize on the association of Aspen with a cold, wintry environment to promote their chilled apple soda pop. This marketing approach seemingly aimed at portraying Aspen as a sophisticated beverage targeting an older demographic rather than a younger one. Though its tenure was brief, this plucky upstart attempted to carve out a niche for apple pop amidst an onslaught of fruit-flavored soda pops. It was eventually rebranded and revamped as Apple Slice. With just a snap of apple, Aspen was gone in a snap by 1982. The exact reasons for PepsiCo's discontinuance are fully transparent, but it's possible that consumers merely liked citrus flavors and sophisticated sounding sodas didn't sell. Stretch Armstrong. This was a large gel-filled action figure that was first introduced in 1976 by Kenner. Stretch Armstrong was made of latex rubber filled with a proprietary gelled substance similar to corn syrup which allows it to retain shape for a short time before shrinking to its original shape. This is an action figure shaped as a short muscular man with blonde hair, wearing black trunks. The doll's most notable feature is that it can be stretched from its normal size of about 15 inches to four to five feet. If a tear does develop, it can be fixed with an adhesive bandage. Information on how to repair stretch is provided in the toy's instruction booklet which is included in the original box. The Stretch Man idea, as it was called, was pursued with two different bodies in mind. One was a sumo wrestler, and the other was an all-American blonde hunk. The sumo man was too bulky and large, so the all-American body was cast by Kenner's model maker Richard Dobeck, and the resultant resin model was taken to a latex doll manufacturer in New Jersey, where the first bodies were dipped. As the unbreakable toy, he was perfect bending, pulling, twisting. Nothing could bust him. His extraordinary stretchiness drove fans to the toy, as its limbs could be pulled out to four times their natural span, and still managed to squeeze back to normal size without the smallest stretch mark. In 2016, at the New York Toy Fair, Hasbro announced the return of the Stretch Armstrong toy in its original 1976 design, Schoolhouse Rock. The Schoolhouse Rock series of animated musical shorts that ran on the ABC network on weekend mornings from 1973 to 1985 dazzled a generation of young viewers raised in front of the television. Vibrant, catchy, exuberant, fast-paced, and entertaining, they were also educational and instructive about basic grammar, mathematics, science, and American history. David McCall, president of New York's McCaffrey and McCall Advertising Agency, conceived the series. 
He had observed that his young son had trouble learning his multiplication table, but easily and happily recounted the lyrics and music of popular songs. The first animated shorts, a series of songs with titles such as Zero My Hero and Three is the Magic Number, appeared in January 1973. In the early 70s, Saturday morning cartoons became an institution, and the networks were under pressure to run programming that was perceived as having social value. In 1974, the Federal Communication Commission established guidelines for children's programming in an effort to improve their educational content. In this regard, Schoolhouse Rock's timing was perfect. The spots were broken into five subject areas, multiplication, grammar, American history, science, and computers. The design, colors, and lyrics of the spots were in tune with the aesthetic and the ethic of this era. The series won four Emmy Awards, making McCaffrey and McCall the first advertising agency ever to win the coveted television prize. Well, there you have it, folks. 10 things to remember if you grew up in the 1970s. Whether you were rocking out to disco music or playing with your favorite toys, the 70s will always hold a special place in our hearts. Thanks for joining me on this nostalgic journey. Until next time, stay groovy.